Hi everybody, thank you for coming. So this is a paper about driving and how we can use different modalities <laughs> to alert drivers about different events on the road. Uh, I'm a third year PhD in the University of Glasgow from Multimodal Interaction Group, co-funded by Freescale Semiconductor, and this is a work relating to uh, my PhD. So basically, what the motivation is of this work is how do we, how do we use different modalities to alert drivers, as I said before, but also what is the content of the modalities that is more affordable to do so. Uh, we have used in the past different interpretation, different types of cues in our studies, and some of them are abstract, as in they have no concrete semantic association to the event they try to signify, but also we looked into language-based ones, so basically using speech in order to do that. Um, we also have looked into how the event uh, on the road can influence this, uh, these different responses that we can get from these modalities. So a little bit of um, prior work into that. We base a lot uh, on prior work on multimodal displays, which was in the context of driving. So other people have used uh, audiovisual or tactile cues, vibration basically, to alert drivers. Uh, but these have not been combined too much in terms of how they can compare between speech and non-speech cues. Another notion we use uh, quite a lot, uh, it's the notion of urgency, that's what it is written over there on the right. So basically how are we able to design differently urgent cues, how are we able to convey the urgency of the message uh, by designing different, differently urgent cues and we can do this basically by changing the, sp the pitch of the, of the audio file, but we can also use interpulse interval and that's what we also use for our abstract cues. Another notion is the notion of urgency in speech cues. So this, is, this has to do with uh, what is the content of the message and how can the message be uttered, how can it be spoken in order to convey these different, this differently uh, urgent warnings and what, the, what we need basically to say to the driver. And finally, this is some of our prior work <coughs> uh, here in CHI, is basically combining all these different modalities in the presence or the absence of a critical event. And what we found there was that the critical event indeed did influence the way that <coughs> people responded to these warnings. So to bring this all together, how can we basically compare language-based and abstract cues in this context, in the context of driving? And for these particular two experiments, we used objective measures. So we basically measured response times, recognition times, and other driving metrics in order to be able to give some guidelines on what cues work best. So th we use the speech tactons as a part of uh, language-based cues. These are some vibrational messages that derive from audio cues. So if we use the original audio file, we're able to make some simple modifications to this cue and have a, a vibrational message that has the same rhythm as the audio cue. And in this sense, we have like an attenuated kind of feeling of uh, what the person is saying, uh, aided by vibration. And the equipment we used was simple headphones for the audio cues and a scenario of a smartwatch which was able to provide vibrations for the tactons. I'm going to try and play some of the, of the cues that we used in this work. So this is first of all the abstract cues. As you can see, they are simple uh, vib uh, beeps basically. I'm going to try to play the high urgency one just for you to see what is the difference between the cues. So this was a, a kind of a loud repeated beep uh, as opposed to a low urgency one, which was uh, lower in pitch but also slower in interpulse interval. It was directly synchronous in all modalities, audio, visual and tactile, so the colors that you see there were flashing colors in the same way that the vibration and audio were uh, repeating. In terms of language-based cues, this is a high urgency message. Danger! Collision imminent! And this is a, a low urgency one. Notice, call and win free tickets. Just for... <laughs> and just for completion, I'm gonna also play the medium one, just for you to see like how they are differently uh, uttered in each case. Warning, left side headlamp out. So you can see that uh, we asked the actor to really 
pronounce it in a really urgent manner if it was a high urgency message, a deadpan manner for the low urgency, and something in between, kind of, a, kind of like a casual conversation for the medium urgency. And as you see, also for the uh, language-based warnings, we had three distinct levels of urgency that we designed. So we asked some questions. Before the questions, actually, I'm going to show you what modalities we used. We, we basically used all combinations of audio, visual, and tactile modalities. You can see there from unimodal and bi uh, bimodal and trimodal signals. And we combined all these different ways. By the way, language-based were also synchronous. So when there was a vibration, you would also feel the vibration in the same way with the speech. And we tried to compare these different warnings. The setup we used was a simple desktop simulator, so people were able to manipulate uh, a car in front uh, and looking at the car in front. And they were able to use the steering wheel or the brake pedal for different tasks. And they, they would also use the buttons of the steering wheel. I'm going to explain how they used it. And as you see, there is a comparison between the language-based ones, which are below, and the the abstract ones which, which are on top. So the first experiment looked into um, some objective measures re uh, relating to a non-urgent task. So what we designed was a simple button response task. If you imagine driving your car and you had to recognize how urgent the message was, you would be able to press a button on the steering wheel. So this is HML. I don't know if it's visible, but it's basically for high, medium, or low urgency. And once you would receive the cue, you were able to respond as quickly as possible so that we can tell what is the recognition time of this. And of course, we measured how accurate people were for this task. So uh, as you see there, the factors were modality, all these modalities that I explained before, the information, which is language-based or abstract, and the designed urgency, high, medium, or low. Again, these three different levels that we designed across uh, informational cues. There was a repeated exposure to the cues. They were in random intervals, and people just needed to press the button to tell us what they thought of the cue, what, what cue it was, basically, to recognize them. Some results for this. We found that vibration was the slowest and the least accurate. We found that audio was kind of in between. So as you can see, T is for tactile, A is for audio, and V is for visual. And you can see there are all the combinations presented. So audio and audio tactile were kind of an in-between result. They were not the quickest one, but then we have the multimodal cues along with the unimodal visual cue in the group of the quickest ones. So people were able to really recognize cues, including visuals, the best, which indicates us that they were uh, given some visual attention in order to interpret these cues and make sense of what they would mean. In terms of um, urgency levels, you can see there that the quickest one to be recognized was the high one, so the more urgent cues. And then we have medium and low urgency uh, levels that didn't differ to each other. This is kind of a result that we get almost every time. So the more urgent cues are the ones that are indeed uh, quicker, more quickly recognized. And this can't be because of the cue design in terms of time. So all cues are, at least the abstract ones, have the same time. Uh, they span across the same time, okay? So this is something that, for us, it means that it actually uh, uh, creates an increased urgency feeling to people. That's why they're able to do this quickly. In terms of abstract and language-based cues, abstract were better in this task. People were better in identifying what the message content was when it was an abstract one. And this has some implication also about the cue design that I will discuss in a minute. So before I, I discuss these results, let's go to the second experiment. This was looking into a task of more uh, cr higher criticality. There was an event happening along with a cue presentation, which was the car in front braking. So this really small dot that you can see there is the car. And when there was a high urgency cues, so where the mouse is at the moment, the car was braking towards the participant. In the other two cases, with medium and low urgency cues, nothing was happening. So people uh, needed just to ignore the cues and do nothing else. We measured how quick people were. They just needed to step on the brake. So for the high cues, high urgency cues, and for the other ones, they just, need, they just needed to ignore the cues. So we measured response time for this task, for the high urgency one. And in general, we also measured the driving metrics. Uh, <coughs> when I say driving metrics, it's basically how well people were able to stay in the center of the lane 
and this indicates that they were better, uh, that they were more attentive. So if these values would be lower, people would be more attentive to the driving task. Results for this one, the visual cues were the slowest. So it's an opposite, an opposite result to the previous one. People were the slowest into, in recognizing, uh, in responding to such cues. Then we have the vibration, tactile and tactile visual, and multimodal cues, so the tactile visual, but also unimodal audio. So basically, as you can see there, all cues, including audio, were the quickest ones. So this tells us uh, a bit that people were able to really use sound in order to respond to this uh, more critical task. Before I go to discussion, a little bit about uh, steering behavior. So you can see there, there was not much significance in steering behavior. The most significant thing that we found was that people, when there was a high urgency event, so if you remember the car braking towards the participant, then this slightly disrupted their driving behavior. They were a little bit more, um, uh, more less accurate with steering the wheel and keeping in the center of the lane. And you can see there, these are meters basically, so you can see that disruption was significant, but yeah, it wasn't huge. So what do these results mean? First of all, uh, about the low criticality task, when identifying a queue, we found a, an advantage of the abstract queues. So people were able to tell what, what, what was the queue content in terms of urgency more quick uh, compared to the language-based ones. To be fair to the language-based queues, they were longer in total, so all the abstract queues were about 1.5 seconds, and the language-based ones were at least 2.5 seconds, as far as I remember, so there was a difference between the length of the queues, which, I mean, if, if, if I would do this again, we would, design the st we would design them in a more fair manner, but we still could see that, uh, especially in the next experiment, that they could still compete to each other. Uh, about the modalities, we saw the, an advantage of visuals, so people really used their visual attention in order to interpret uh, what was the message about. This does come with limitations, which we see in the next experiment, but it's still a result that we can take into account when there isn't anything critical in the driving task that people need to be attentive to. So about the critical task, we had a different result, audio was now more important uh, for interpretation and for reaction. Uh, th this also links to the previous study that I explained before, uh, where we find a visual overload of, uh, uh, yeah, an overload of the visual modality when there is a, a critical event happening in the driving scene. And it was actually this exact scenario that we found here, and we kind of repeated this result. We saw that people with weren't that good with cues, including visuals. Uh, for this forced response task. So that's why I said that uh, visuals are not always the best to use. We didn't find any significant difference between abstract or uh, versus language-based cues for the critical task. They performed equally well. But we have results from previous, study, uh, from previous studies, uh, some, some of our own previous study uh, about these language-based cues, and they are better perceived. So we, not entirely from this paper, but for the comp from the combination of this work, we can s give a, a, a slight uh, nudge towards the language-based ones, because they are equally good with the abstract ones, and they don't disrupt uh, subjective metrics as much. Finally, about seeing performance, it was only disrupted for high urgency cues, which kind of comes in line with um, how, were peop how people felt the more uh, increased notion of urgency, they were more uh, kind of uh, alerted by this whole situation when there was a car braking and a high urgency queue presented, was not disrupted in the, in the other cases, medium and low urgency queues. Before I go to the last slide, just a bit of future work. What we did now is that we moved these queues in an autonomous vehicle, and this, this work is not presented here, but it's just the next step. We tried out how people are able to come back to driving when they're not driving and how these different modalities are, uh, compare in order to bring drivers back to the road. Uh, hopefully you will hear about it in the next paper. And finally, as a last slide, these are just basically the recommendations that I just mentioned before. Low criticality task, we see an advantage of visuals. Uh, high criticality, we see an advantage of audio. And multimodality is always good 
uh, for both tasks, and we can see an interchangeable character of language-based ones for these two type for these two types uh, of cues. So, thank you very much. Uh, Eleonora Ibrahimova from the Delft University of Technology. I'm still worried about the, thanks for the presentation. <laughs> worried about the safety of the driver. I'm sure you probably have gotten a lot of questions or comments about it because if I'm uh, in a critical situation and I'm already uh, panicking, if somebody starts beeping at me or shouting at me, I might be kind of going. Crazy. So you mean if they would actually disrupt the way people, the way people would react? Yeah, exactly. So it's adding up a complexity to already a complex situation. Yes, so we have, uh, this was not in this study, as I said before, we have tried the, these cues in the presence and in the absence of the event, and the people are actually quicker when there is a queue along with the event versus when there isn't any queue along with the event. So they are quicker. There is some slight uh, degradation of string performance, so they might swivel a little bit. <laughs> but uh, yes, they're still quicker to respond to the event. Uh, so subjectively, they ha there is kind of a mixed results. They find these cues more annoying, so yeah. this, ties, this ties kind of to what you said, but they also find these cues more useful, so they uh, acknowledge that they would like to have these cues. So if it's a high urgency event, yeah. they would like to have these cues. If it's not, I completely agree with you, we need to avoid them. Okay. And uh, also kind of a quick uh, remark or question, because uh, in, uh, in the car there are a lot of audio information such as uh, maybe navigation or music from my radio do you think <laughs> this kind of goes? yeah so uh, we yeah that's true we cannot control for that and this is one of the reasons that we use so many modalities because there is uh, there is an inter interchangeable character between them so for example if there is your radio on then hopefully you can have some vibration that will let you know that something's going on or if you want some privacy or if you, uh, if you don't want some privacy and you want everybody to know something, then you might use audio. But yeah, limit it's definitely, it definitely has limitations uh, mm -hmm. that you just say, yeah. And I would be really interested in following up your future research. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Andrea Niculescu from uh, Institute of Infocom Research Singapore. A very interesting talk. Uh, my question relates to the experimental settings. So uh, you perform the experiment in a lab, I uh, assume, true. yes. And then um, how how do you estimate actually the um, the difference between a real situation and a lab situation? Because we also worked on something similar, and one of the critics was yeah. that uh, there is a that might be a discrepancy between that's the real yeah. situation. Th yeah, that's uh, one very common common. You're right. Um, we cannot really say uh, that this would work in, uh, exactly the same in a real situation. What we can say is that we can point to studies, available studies that have found that indeed there is a similar uh, situation, like similar things that you can observe inside and outside the lab. But also when you look into critical events, it's really difficult to simulate them uh, in a real situation. Yeah. I mean, you have like repeated uh, almost crashes, uh, you know, uh, that you can control. Uh, so simply, logistic-wise, it's, it's something that sometimes we cannot avoid, to be honest. Uh, also, that was actually my second question on yeah. how you simulate the critical event. So the and how did you know that people, they really took it as a critical event? Or yeah. Because it was so it was a really simple one. Uh, maybe I didn't mention there was a car braking towards the participant along with the queue. It was really coming close as if they would crash. Uh, a crash was not allowed by the software, but yeah. it was something that, it, it was like a mini, uh, imminent collision. So that, that was the event that we used. And it was an event that we used in also in another study, which we found that it indeed creates this notion of urgency. So okay. it wasn't, okay. uh, we didn't invent it in, in this yeah, study. Yeah, no, 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 sure. Yeah, then you measured uh, how people uh, fell towards the critical event. Yes, so that was not in this study, not in, in a previous one. one. Yeah. Okay, hey, thank you. Okay, uh, then I will just make one question. Did you, or bundle them? Uh, did you test for fatigue, uh, auditory fatigue, and uh, did you find any uh, appropriate threshold to separate what a critical auditory feedback notification should be? 
So uh, it's no to both. So first of all, about fatigue, it was a kind of a psychology type experiment. It lasted about one hour, so we didn't really repeat this too much or had time to see about uh, how fatigued the driver might become. So we didn't test for that. Also, we didn't have uh, any DALI questionnaires or any other measures of workload, which we thought that's a good idea and actually used it in a different study. So yeah, that's a point of improvement. About uh, thresholds, we used guidelines, ready-made guidelines. So we used varying uh, um, uh, interpulse intervals and for abstract warnings and different, you know, uh, voice pitches, which was kind of forced to the actor for language-based ones. And again, in previous study, we found that this worked uh, subjectively. People really identified the different uh, urgency levels really clearly, so we just repeated these cues. Thanks. Hi, Florian Heller um, Hi. from RWTH Aachen University. Nice work. I have a question regarding uh, how you designed the, uh, yeah, the, the messages. Uh -huh. And if you compare that, for example, to aircraft cockpits, where uh -huh. they basically get an instruction how to solve that problem by telling by the having the warning telling them uh, to pull up or something. You mean like uh, how we made them, like how we created yeah, them? Yeah, so basically it says uh, danger, collision, imminent, but uh -huh. it could also just say uh, break or turn. Right, right, right. Yeah. So um, the uh, in terms of the language ones, we used danger, uh, warning, and notice were some uh, already available words to us from Edgeworthy's work, I think, in 2003. So th uh, they tested the, the, the word content. They found that danger creates more uh, urgent responses, warning in between, notice uh, the lowest. The second part, what the message was about, we used, uh, I'm afraid I can't remember the number, but it was an ISO standard. Uh, it's in the paper, which can categorizes messages in terms of criticality to the driver, relevance to the driver. So, yeah collision imminent was in the highest, uh, among the highest ones because they're about 50. Uh, the other one was in between and the lowest one was uh, among the lowest ones. So we used, um, again, we used pre-decided uh, content for that. Okay, thank you. Thanks.